Okay. Well, so yes, I'm David. I'll talk a bit about what I do at Pikeson and what we found out testing our system. So we build chat and voice bots. Uh, and yes, let's get right into it. So one question that came up during the review of my abstract was, well, where, where does your experience come from? So we have many voice and chatbot projects. I myself was mostly involved with the, with the voice bot projects, in particular those three. So we have a voice bot for SBB, where you can ask train connections, prizes, and some other infos. We have a voice bot for local search, where you can search for restaurants or get a recommendation for restaurants and also reserve seats. And we have a voice bot for MoneyKey, which is a portal for a trustee company. So it can give their, uh, their customers uh, up-to-date info about the, about the finances of their companies. In this presentation, I will mostly focus on examples from SPB because just because I think those are the easiest to, to understand and because we found some very interesting things there. So what will I talk to you about? I mean, basically my statement is conversational systems don't work without automated testing. We tell you what, what do we test currently? What do we want to test and why it's not always as easy? And then uh, my favorite part is, is a bit showing about how we use mostly third party models for the natural language processing side of things and showing you how we were able to get some insight just by looking at test failures. And then at the end, I just want to talk about what's the difference between, between conversational tests and, and normal software tests. So maybe quickly, what do I mean by conversational systems? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ones. I talk about a particular kind here. I think much of what I say is applicable to many of them. So in my case, we just have, we have a happy user, hopefully happy that has some information need or wants something processed and then expects the system to give him a reply with that information or a confirmation of what it did. The way it works is he says something like, when does the train to burn depart? And it goes into some statistical NLP system. This is basically what we treat as black box just because we usually just use dialogue flow. Um, this is trained with some training data that we provided it. It's typically supervised, but I don't think it matters for what I'm talking about. And this has then the task of telling us, okay, what, what was the intention of the user? What of the different functionalities that we provide does the user want? So in this case, the train departure time and what did he provide as information? So he, we know that he wanted to go to burn. And with this information, then our bot, which is basically just doing deterministic processing creates creates an answer sentence that says the next train to burn departs at 1 29 p.m so the conversational system is basically the the nlp part and kind of the bot logic that does all the all the state management or most of the state management so what do we test one thing is of course the the bot logic. So we test with, with normal unit tests, the bot logic for how do we get the information the user wants? How are we creating answers? Do the answers make sense? And do the context we set or basically does the flow in the conversation uh, or the next expected answers match? And the other thing we do is testing the, the uh, NLP system. We call them NLP tests because for us, it's just the NLP system. I mean, yes, it's a particular kind of NLP system, but basically we give him examples, just sentences, and we test whether the intents and entities it recognizes match with what we have, uh, whether it's confident enough about them, things like that. Then there's things we don't do yet, but we'd like to do more, or we do very limited right now. So one is conversational tests for really testing a flow with like multiple steps that then tests kind of the bot logic and the, and the NLP system in combination, because it, it means that the bot logic has, has to give the right information about context to the NLP system. And the other thing is currently we are usually in a low data setting, like we, we come up with the training examples or customers don't have, have data collections that we can, can use. Uh, so we build all the test cases by hand, but something nice would be that once we're productive, we could build more comprehensive test sets by seeing at what actual input we have, but which is not there yet. What we don't do is like true end-to-end -end tests. It's kind of, I guess, what's promised by the title when I say testing the conversational system as a black box. 
there's two reasons for that. One is that like if you have Google Assistant or Alexa, the conversational interface have some flows that are outside of our control. And for a true end-to-end -end test, you want to test those. So yeah, if you have to log in a user or you have, if you want to get their location, there's just flows that are controlled by their side. And the other thing is, is more of a project development thing, which is if you have end-to-end -end tests, the response, changes in the response can, can break the tests. And usually when it gets close to a release, the customers get nervous and then the wording changes more. They get more picky about how they want the wording. And so you don't want your recognition tests to fail because, because you changed the wording or the customer requested some changes to the wording. Okay, so why can't we just test all this manually? Um, Basically, we have a statistical NLP system. Every time you add something new, we add training data. Um, it changes it changes some distributions and it changes the way things are recognized. And the thing is even more so than in traditional software, it's unpredictable where it changes. So if we do a manual test, we focus on what we actually changed. And usually check like, okay, does it work how we changed it? Does the related stuff work? And then maybe a rough smoke test. However, when we don't know where the changes could happen, because we don't see all them, I mean, we'll see there's a lot of structure that we can look at, but it's just not, not feasible to test everything manually. Um, so when we just fix that bug that we found, for sure there will be other bugs that show up because we changed the training data again. And so my statement is without automated regression tests, um, fixing things will cause other bugs in, in production. You will have regressions. And I mean, even if you have them, you'll still find uh, a, uh, still find things that you haven't, haven't caught. But the good thing is whenever you find something, you can add it to your test set and test for it in the future, making sure it doesn't happen again. Yes, so why, why is it particularly tricky? It's really because we have a statistical system that we don't very little about. We don't necessarily know how it works. And uh, even when we do, it might be hard to interpret the parameters. And that leads to tests that, that fail. And we don't know why, because we didn't change anything uh, that was similar to that. And this can lead to frustration and even to the temptation to, to just skip the test. I mean, we do, we do code reviews, so, so my colleague will certainly realize it. So that's why I was always saved from doing it, even in high stress situations. So now I wanna talk about what we can learn from those failing tests. And I think when something unrelated fails is what we've seen, it's actually a warning. There might be something wrong with the way we use the data or with what we assume about the system. I mean, as I said, we usually use dialogue flows or we don't have access to the model, but I mean, even if you have the model, it might not be that simple to see what, what changed. And the core point is really scanning the test for patterns. I will give you two examples about that. And uh, I, think, I think the thing is you don't need to think about it, about the similarity of tests in terms of what is the content, what is being tested, but more so in, a, in the structure. In the, it can be in the linguistic structure or, yeah, I mean, in, in different kinds of linguistic structures. So, I mean, we've seen many cases where it's just like, we have new examples and they just use a word that just happens because we, I mean, we do all the, the training examples by hand, just has used, been used in very few examples and they can trip up, trip up the system, obviously. Those are the easy cases because you can just search through the training data. Okay, failing test uses this, the new data uses this and it doesn't show up anywhere else and you'll know what, what the balance and why, why you need more examples with this word. Other things are, of course, just entity annotations. If you get them wrong, it will, it will have an influence on everything else that uses this entity. And this is particularly important in the SVB case because there for every information, whether it's price, whether it's the time, whether it's the track where it departs, you typically have the same entities. You have a departure place, an arrival place, a date, maybe what kind of train. We'll also get into a second into why their order might be important. And then one thing I wasn't aware of, but 
that that we realized during all this is that the parser has a lot of power in those systems, or at least in, in dialogue flow that we used, but I'm pretty sure that it's the same in other systems. So if you have certain prepositional phrases or subordinate clauses that might just trip up the parser, and um, maybe you can find a way for handling them. One last point is don't just compare the failing test with what you added, but also compare the failing test with what still works. I think that's something that we only started doing and it helped us a lot of realizing where in that long sentence, because in SPB we have, we have quite a lot of parameters, the, the problem might, might lie. So yes, now let me let me show you what what we got from from really scanning the tests for these patterns. So the story is always kind of the same that we had test failures, we added examples and like two weeks later similar tests would would break again. And at some point we just took the time to really look at it. So here I have an example from our training data. We have like different intents. For example, we, we ask for the price or we ask for the, for the connection. So when does the train depart? And one thing is that we had problems that it would just switch up those intents. Although it's very simple to distinguish them because if you ask about the cost or talk about a ticket, it's always, it's always asking about the price and not the connection. But what, what we saw, we had examples in both intents and they both had a departure, an arrival, um, a train type, for example, and, and a time. And we realized that those tests that fail usually have a different order of entities than in, in, the, in that intent training set. And so, Yes, I mean, basically what it, what it took us was, was realizing that it happens again and again, because there's just so many orders. And we learned about it, okay, for some reason, the model needs a balance between the intents that the order of entities appears in all of them. Otherwise, it will think it's a different intent just because the order of entities is different. And so that then led us to the, to the solution, which was basically we could generate training templates by just generating the orders of the entities and then filling out, filling out with new examples. Yes, and one second example about this that's maybe a little bit simpler. Um, so some stations for, for distinguishing them, because long now, for example, exist in different places, have prepositions in them. So you have like long now im Emmental, or Stein am Rhein. And those stations often caused problems because they would trip up. Like we're here, we have long now im Emmental is the departure and open cell is the arrival. And for some reason, the system would just every, well, often start saying, okay, long now is the departure and Emmental and Opencell are the arrival, which is, I mean, really odd because basically nach is like, after nach you have like 99%, you have the arrival. So it should be, it should be super simple. But after, after fixing this for multiple times, we realized that our, our approach to, to fixing the stations was wrong because what was probably happening is that the parser saw this as a prepositional phrase and this as a prepositional phrase and so it just started thought oh the first prepositional phrase after the departure is the is the arrival and so what we had to do is basically make the parser ignore the entire token so that we could we could say that long now im emmental is an entire station because what do we do is we say long now im emmental and open cell are all station terms and, it, and then the parser just kind of parsed it out and said yes it is still a station 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 and then and then just used the, the syntactic feature but the prepositions are not good station terms so that's why then we built like a specific list of all of those stations that have prepositions in them where they're only recognized as one whole entity. So before I get to the last part of my talk, I just quickly want to summarize this point that really I think the core thing is um, to look to look at the tests that fail that seem unrelated, not just as a nuisance, but really as, as a chance to realize where there are structural weaknesses in, in how we annotate or how we use the system. 
So one last thing is a bit about why, why are conversational tests different than normal tests? And the core thing is really, I mean, they already work. The input is already a human sentence. And I mean, in normal software, we often like we have we have domain-driven design. You talk about the ubiquitous language there, which is all about it's very important that the business and the developers talk about the same thing. And it's also very hard to achieve that. And I think this is a core advantage we have when working with conversational systems, that the input is already already language. Yes, there's a lot of variety in the input that we need to handle but it still gives you certain common terms that, that make it easier to, to communicate. And so in our long-term view, we kind of want to work toward using some kind of behavior-driven development approach of, of uh, writing these tests. Because if we can discuss the functionality in terms of actual examples or test cases with our customers, then they also know more what we're talking about. Because often when you just talk about, oh, the system then gives back that, it's, it's very abstract. So yes, we hope we hope that we get there that we really can use also the, the tests that's already as a as a requirements tool. As a first step, we're currently developing a small framework and library to ease of writing the tests. We called it Don't Get Me Wrong. And the idea is just that we have in all the projects because we uh, we use the same framework so we can profit from all the all the improvements. And basically the way it works is we really give it a sentence and then we check, for example, the, the intent. I mean, this is the example that we had in the beginning. And, and that way you can already write it almost like a sentence. Obviously then in, in BDD, you really have, have a scenario, uh, but I think this is a first step. Yeah, and I think that that is one thing we do to improve the development process and uh yeah i hope this was interesting um i just want to summarize so conversational systems in in uh in production just don't work without automated regression tests because you can't always test all the changes manually uh for me the most interesting part was it is possible to generate insight even if you don't know anything about how the model works you can find out by analyzing test failures uh, what what kind of problems uh, it might generate or what might be the cost of the problems. And finally, I think test cases and conversational systems are particularly suited for, for use as a communication tool also with business stakeholders more so than normal software. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, David. Are there any questions? Yes, mommy. You're still muted. Okay. No, he was clapping hands. Oh, I was clapping. I, yeah. I thought he was rising hands. <laughs> I also thought so. Uh, that was not what I wanted. I wanted to stop the share. <clears throat> so, thank you. Uh, yeah. So you, you mentioned dialogue flow several times. Do you also have experience with, with Rasa or other frameworks which you could compare and give a hint to possible new people working on dialogue systems, how which framework they should rely on? Okay, so first of all, I don't have a lot of experience with Rasa personally. I know that our company has some applications with Rasa, but for them, it was like, because they do certain things different, like I think they don't share the entities across intents, it needs more training. And I mean, the amazing thing is that Dialogflow really uses very little training examples to already get something that's kind of working. Obviously, then the more complex the examples get, the more examples you need. I mean, in the SPB, we have intents with, with uh, 200, 300 uh, examples, but some things already work with like 20 examples. I think that's one difference. But otherwise, I mean, it's still on my to-do list for this year to really get into, into Gaza. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. I really enjoy it. Um, I need to uh, know a very short uh, question about uh, what you presented in part related to uh, name entity recognition and the order that you mentioned there. 
I guess it's about a slide nine. Yes, uh, nine. I'll share again if I come back. Oh, yes, the, yes, let me quickly share the screen again. Ah, was, sorry, thanks. Yeah, all good. So yeah, I yeah. think you should see it again. Yes, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, I want to know that how did you extract this? Uh, I mean, uh, how did you get the training data? Did you use uh, like um, um, some uh, manual way to train it or using regex or this is first and the secondly, how did you make a balance? I mean, you mentioned that the order is important and we should pay attention to the orders of these entities. Um, so, the question is that how did you do it? And because normally it's not easy to like change these things you know, during the, your training data. Yes, so basically all the all the examples are handcrafted. And so then what we did is basically from each intent, we kind of extracted just what is the order of for each training example, we extracted what is the order of the of the entities from from that data. And then we just basically did sets of orders and just did set comparison and then generated basically just just a template. So we would say like A. B, C, D, E, and we could just import this and then do manual. So rewrite, write, come up with manual examples. I mean, there might have been some orders that don't don't make sense, but usually in German, because you can move around clauses a lot and those yeah. like departure arrival, you can come up with an example for that. So all we did is basically generate, okay, which pattern do we need? And then and then you can just let someone figure out how to make a good training sentence out, out of that. Okay, so of course, there's get, so, generate yeah. based on some uh, some default pattern somehow. Well, we already uh, had when we found this out. We already had a lot of training examples, just uh, not all of them in all of the intents, because we have like okay, you have a connection request where you ask for the departure time. You have a connection request where you ask for the arrival time. You have like you ask for the price with departure and arrival. You ask for the for the how many people are there, and in some of them we already had a lot of examples. In in others we had less so, but we had different orders, and that would then then skew the training. So we just could could just generate basically set difference for one versus one of each of them. Okay, I see. But it's, I mean, it's interesting for me because this part, for example, could have been done by regex, like, and then, I don't know, did you use SPC or which kind of? Well, okay, I mean, the, the entities are, are manually annotated. Manually. Okay. So basically, we really just did, did a deterministic, like, okay, which orders do we have? Which orders do we need? Um, generated that and then came up with new examples. Okay. And the good thing is now we can also generate generate the orders that we need if we have an entirely new intent. Hmm. Because defining also this um, kind of the structure for the annotator is look like not a very easy task. For example, heute um uh, I didn't. I mean, probably you define some uh, way for your annotator to annotate it. Yes. Yes, I mean, with times, there are some rules. There is also right, some right. dialogue flow specific things with times. I, I just took this example because it was easy easy to show that like the order can defer. And we had problems that suddenly, like if you set things in, in this order, but without the was costed as ticket, it would still be recognized as a, as a price request, although it was really a connection request and it should have been obvious mm. that it should be. I guess was a you, connection. you are a bit like uh, easier in German because. I heard it was tecamelo, tem temporal, ca casual, and then it comes with this kind of word. But yeah, I mean, I guess in German it's a bit easier. Like you have this kind of balance more in comfort. I mean, I think so. I mean, I yeah, I mean, it's it's possible. I mean, for us it worked very well here. It's definitely language dependent. Okay, thank you. Uh, I saw some question in the chat. I think, but I can't find the chat anymore. <laughs> Uh, it's just um, I might pose a question like this: um, What kind of tools do you use if you if you want to try to understand the grammatical structures? Are there any tips and tricks what we can go for? Maybe maybe Spacey or NLTK is very common. I would say. Is there anything else maybe you, would, you could recommend? 
Well, it, it depends a bit. I mean, if if you have written the, the test examples yourself, then you're probably quicker just just by intuition or just by by trying out a couple of things. Be I mean, it depends on the size of training data. Otherwise, I would I would probably really try to go for something. I mean, you could even do some some kind of clustering, I guess, of training examples, and then see if if you find something there, which of course is a lot of work. Um, Honestly, it's it would be interesting to see how how this scales and what kind of tools you need if you really have huge training sets. Because for our size, it's just way quicker to quickly look at okay, we have those five failures. We have changed those ten sentences or twenty sentences or even fifty sentences, and and look at what the connection is between them or look at which tests didn't fail, uh, just by hand. But obviously, like. One one thing we do a lot is just looking at like okay what are the where do these words show up so just simple word counts for the for the examples that fail and that we changed and where they didn't change and those words showed up. But that's just custom made so we we haven't really gone into setting up an infrastructure for this but it's a it's a very good idea to think about what kind of tools would be useful for that. Thank you. Yes, thanks for explanation. Thank you. Um, I also have a quick question. You mentioned initially, um, David, that this is a voice bot for yes. LCD. So if it's a voice bot, is it working in German or Swiss dialect? Um, it's it's German. I mean, basically the thing is we, we'd love to do Swiss German, but I mean, it's a Google action. So we're basically bound to what Google gives us because the assistant that just gives us text, we don't get any access to the audio mm -hmm. and Google doesn't yet do Swiss German uh, speech recognition in this case. I mean, we, we have some, we have some prototypes building where we work together with some Swiss German speech recognition, but those are entirely different and they're really more prototypes about showing that it even works with Swiss German and less so about really building something, some application. Okay. So, Thanks for clarifying. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Dave, you. and to all the audience who have been here. We are almost in time, just a little bit overstressed. And uh, I wish you a good lunch. And we will be back quarter past one for the battle of NLP ideas. Thank you very much. And Enjoy your lunch. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.